Hi everyone, I'm David Lennonhawk and this is Dave's Film Faves. Sorry for being so close up, but today I'm talking about the film All the Boys Love Mandy Lane, and I even have a poster for it. Ooh, let's get started. My apologies if that last angle was way too close to this face. So, talking now about All the Boys Love Mandy Lane, a movie that was probably more known for its really horrible attempt to get into theaters because of stuff that happened behind the scenes than the actual quality of the film. But this is a film that I had heard really good things about in the horror press, uh, the normal um, websites that deal only and exclusively with horror movie reviews saw this movie at festivals and it got really good notices. And then it was supposed to be released. And then it wasn't. And then it wasn't. And then it was released in England. And then years went on and we never heard anything about this movie getting released in the United States. I ended up getting to it only because it was released in England, it was released on video in England, and luckily this was a region-free Blu-ray. At least for the movie. The extras are region-encoded, so I cannot watch the, the two extras on here, a trailer and an interview with Amber Heard. Uh, but the movie itself plays on a US Blu-ray player, so I was able to buy this off of the British Amazon.co.uk, and I was able to see it years before most people in the US were able to see it, unless they pirated it, but I didn't want to do that. So, ended up getting into it. Uh, by the way, that's why it has the, uh, the BBFC rating in the, uh, the bottom corner there, instead of, you know, R or whatever. So what's the movie about? Well, uh, we start off at a high school, we have some teenagers. Mandy Lane, the title character, is played by Amber Heard. This is the movie, um, well this and I guess the Informers are uh, the major reason why I had a crush on Amber Heard for a, a little while there. Uh, despite not being the, the typical type of uh, woman I have a crush on. So, um, she's Mandy Lane, uh, she has a friend named Emmett, but otherwise uh, Emmett and Mandy are sort of outcasts. However, because Mandy looks like Amber Heard, some of the popular kids want her to hang out. So they invite her and sort of by proxy Emmett uh, to this pool party where one of the guys uh, kind of hits on her pretty aggressively. She rebuffs his advances, but he's drunk and stupid. So he goes up to the roof of the house after being spurned. And uh, Emmett happens to be there because he is a nerd and a social outcast and he's just sitting there contemplating his thoughts. And uh, the jock guy and Emmett kind of talk. You know, the jock is sort of like, you hang out with her and she's not giving anything up to you. And, you know, because, you know, maybe if, I, if um, you look like me kind of thing, you know, you got to impress that girl. And, uh, and this conversation ends up coming kind of into a dare about whether one of them is going to jump off the roof into the swimming pool. And eventually the jock uh, decides to do it to try to impress Mandy. So he takes a you know big swig of alcohol, goes, hey, Mandy Lane, and he jumps, and he hits his head on the side of the pool concrete, and he dies. Okay. Cut to a year later. Uh, Mandy is a kind of ignoring Emmett uh, at school, uh, but she is starting to hang out with some of the popular kids, kids who were friends with that jock guy. Uh, so they invite her to one of their family's uh, ranch, uh, I guess, a ranch or a farm or something like that. So they go off. Emmett's not invited. Emmett seems scorned. And the movie makes it very, very obvious, even though it kind of, sort of, not really tries to hide who our killer is a little bit, uh, that Emmett is uh, very upset that Mandy is not hanging out with him and may start on a killerous uh, rampage, you know, the, the sort of nice guy scorn who's now jealous that, uh, you know, being trapped in the friend zone type thing. And, and it's an aspect of this movie I, I really sort of like that it, it kind of explored that dynamic. Uh, but Mandy goes um, with these these guys um, and, and a couple of girls as well, and almost all of them are extremely attracted to Mandy Lane uh, to uh, an almost obnoxious uh, extent. There's the, the guy who, um, you know, sort of kind of dares Mandy to kiss him. There's the other jerk who's trying to, like, play uh, different girls uh, in the group against each other. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's also the stoner guy who doesn't pay her much attention. There's, like, the, the blonde mean girl bimbo who's kind of, sort of, slightly flirtatious with Mandy. Um, 
these are all kind of, uh, not necessarily one-dimensional stock characters, but they're not the, the most well-drawn characters either, but you do uh, enjoy spending time with them and everything. Uh, they're, they're interesting characters to, to kind of, you know, fun and watch in this sort of, you know, teeny bopper slasher um, way. But, uh, you know, things uh, go from day to night, and uh, they start uh, dying. <laughs> and it, it's um, by, I think, the third victim, it becomes very clear early on that Emmett is um, knocking them off. And Emmett is just a pure, like, nerd rage murder screaming, like, you're not listening! And there's a couple uh, pretty good kills uh, early on. But that's pretty much where the movie develops. Uh, for, like, the first two acts. Oh, uh, there's also a ranch hand. His name is Garth. Uh, he's, like, a, an older guy, maybe uh, late 30s or early 40s, pretty ruggedly handsome. And um, he's um, trying to keep the kids, you know, don't shoot off guns while you're here because those aren't safe. I don't really care if you drink, but don't do drugs, and I won't have to call, you know, the, the kid's parents who owns the property. And he uh, seems to be a bit nicer to Mandy, and not nicer because he wants to get in her pants nice, but sort of, uh, I know, you know, you're going to have you know, kind of a tough go of it because of all these guys, these sleazy guys giving you attention kind of thing. So he plays a part in it as well. So what makes this movie one of my favorites? Um, let me just start out and say that the film is beautifully shot. It has um, a kind of a uh, mix between Texas Chainsaw Massacre and a Terrence Malick movie, at least as far as just the, the look of it, like the cinematography of it goes. Uh, I wouldn't compare it to any movies uh, by, you know, in the Texas Chainsaw series or anything like that. It's not that kind of thing. It's not a particularly um, violent or scary uh, film for horror. Um, I mostly just like it for where the story ends up going in the third act, which I'll get to. Uh, the director of the movie, a guy named Jonathan Levine, uh, he's mainly stayed away from directing horror after this movie. This was, I believe, his first film, or at least his first, like, major, quote-unquote, film. After this, he's mostly stuck to comedies. He did, like, the, the dramedy 50-50 with Joseph Gordon-Levitt. He did The Night Before, also with Seth Rogen and Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Um, he recently did that, that Amy Schumer movie, Snatched, which wasn't all that good. The closest thing to horror he's done since Mandy Lane is a movie called Warm Bodies, which I didn't see. It's sort of a YA, teeny bopper, uh, zombie movie where the zombies have intelligence, but also kind of a zombie apocalypse thing. I don't know. I, I've heard mixed things. I've heard people who have liked it, and I've heard people who have absolutely despised it. So, I don't know. I haven't seen it. Can't judge. But based on this movie alone, he probably should do more serious straight horror. He just kind of fell into the the, say, the sort of the David Gordon Green, where he used to make, like, indie um, dramas like George Washington, and then he, after Pineapple Express, he ended up just making the sort of, like, Judd Apatow-type comedies. Though I believe he's doing a, a, the next reboot or whatever of the Halloween series now, so I guess maybe he's getting into something else now. But visually, this movie's really cool, and uh, it's got just these expanses of, like, fields and, you know, and, like, windmills and things, or not windmills, but, like, that, that steel, like, I, I've never worked on a farm. Uh, but there, there's really cool, just isolated, desolate shots of, like, farmland that make this really eerie, even though the, the film itself doesn't really do much on its own, it's just the visuals. Also, it's a great soundtrack, there's a lot of songs... Um, some of them vintage and some of them um, modern music. But um, I just really just like this, how the film is encapsulated as far as that. And as far as the acting, I mean, you get some of these like one, one and a half dimensional characters along with our main stuff, but all of the actors are great, especially the, the kid who plays Emmett and, um, and Amber Heard herself. Um, her character seems sort of bland as the movie starts and then as it moves, as it progresses later on, um, she gets to uh, do a little bit of shining in that third act. Not as in The Shining, but, you know, shine through. So, I have to talk about the ending, because this is the only way to really explain what I like about this movie. We find out toward the end that this wasn't just Emmett killing people because he was jealous of them taking away Mandy's attention. We find out that Mandy and Emmett were in on this together. And basically, it was sort of a quasi-Columbine thing, where they were just taking out the, the vapid uh, people in their high school who had no depth and no intelligence and weren't worth anything, which add, which uh, helps to explain why some of those characters are then just one-dimensional people, because the film is trying to delineate between, you know, the thoughtful teenagers and, and the bland, uh, you know, um, stereotypical ciphers that they hate. So it's sort of about, you know, maybe they're like murderous Holden Caulfields who hate the phonies or, or anything like that. Um, 
And it was the idea that Emmett was sort of doing the heavy lifting with all this murder, but uh, Mandy was sort of the brains who was doing all the planning. At least that's the implication that the film gives us. And then uh, toward, uh, toward the end, when most of the people who need to die, according to them, are dead, um, Emmett and Mandy do kiss, and they're going to do a suicide pact where they're going to both kill themselves as well, you know, too pure for this world uh, kind of thing. Uh, and by kissing her, uh, Emmett sort of reveals to Mandy that part of the reason Mandy was killing these people was also just because she was just tired of these bland people's attentions going toward her and that they had nothing to offer except pure desire. And by and it becomes very clear to her, if it wasn't clear before, that Emmett is just another part of this as well. Emmett is just another guy. He's only going along with this, not necessarily because he shares her philosophy. He's doing, going along with this because he also loves her in this very shallow, selfish way. And so she turns on him and plans to frame him. And that leads to a third act where, you know, Mandy and Emmett are essentially trying to kill each other. Uh, and I just sort of like that, you know, there are really two horror movies I can think of that sort of take a view of, like, this teen shooting kind of mentality and apply it to the horror genre. One was Scream, which came out in 1996, so it was three years before Columbine, and it was about, you know, two teenagers who were just, like, hyped up on movies and are just uh, killing people as well as having a, a, a revenge plot as well for the Billy Loomis character played by Skeet Ulrich. And uh, while most of the, the bullied kids or whatever in real life who go on these rampages or these psychopaths, you know, well, Columbine was like a failed bombing that turned into a school shooting, but they usually do these school shootings. You never see anyone in real life, the like teenagers, trying to do like a horror movie thing. I guess, I guess good. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's good that they're not uh, successfully murdering people with knives and slasher instruments. So, I, but I like that films can sort of explore, like, what if you took these people, made them maybe slightly more intelligent so they can get away with spree killings as opposed to a, a single mass killing, um, and sort of get into their, their heads in a filmic way. And so Mandy Lane is the other movie that sort of deals with this, where they're teenagers, they hate their peers, and they're lashing out at them in, like, a great social statement, or at least that seems to be how Mandy and Emmett were planning this before their own dynamic sort of came to a head at the end of this film. Uh, and the, the sort of idea of a, a woman sort of taking agency against the people who objectify her, even though she obviously has a lot more going on. The film also kind of sort of implies that she killed her parents many years ago, but it never explicitly clears that up. I digress. Um, and the idea of not only is she killing the bland ciphers who um, fantasize and objectify her, she also ends up turning against uh, the, the nice guy who's being her friend but still has ulterior motives but still thinks he's above the bland ciphers because he is also doing friends stuff. I guess that's sort of, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the fake feminist internet guy with that uh, is um, sort of coming up uh, lately in uh, internet discourse about these sorts of things. And so this movie's kind of ahead of its time in that regard. But that's probably the aspect I like about it. The, the visual style of this movie's really good. I like spending time with the characters, even the bland cipher ones. Uh, I like a lot of the songs on the soundtrack. It has a really cool music stuff. And I, and I like the how the film ends up making our main characters, or at least Mandy and Emmett, more interesting and in how it sort of says something a little different than, you know, the average, like, slasher movie. Because this movie, this movie sort of positions itself to be somewhere between a Texas Chainsaw Massacre uh, movie, which I wouldn't count as part of the slasher genre, and uh, an actual slasher movie because of um, the teens and the teens being picked off one by one type deal. But the movie also reveals its quote-unquote hidden killer halfway through in Emmett before it gets the other one. Hey, Carl. So, uh, <laughs> I'm not, Carl hasn't seen this movie. I haven't watched it since I've had him. Um, so that's all the boys love Mandy Lane. Um, I know I'm probably not doing a great job of describing what actually sets it apart, but when I first saw this movie, I was really, really into it, and it's still a movie that a lot of people haven't seen that I do recommend. A lot of the reason they haven't seen it is because of what went on behind the scenes. So let me discuss that a little bit. Movie was going to be distributed by the Weinstein Company and their um, their Dimension Films, which usually handled their their horror and their other like genre movies. 
mostly horror, but they also did stuff like the Marlon Wayans comedy Senseless and, and things like that. Then, I mean, Weinstein always fucking screwed up how they released horror movies, but what basically happened was this movie was made in 2006. It was supposed to be released theatrically in 2007. Then um, the Weinstein Company released Grindhouse, the, the Robert Rodriguez, Quentin Tarantino double feature movie that was a, a really lot of fun to go watch in a movie theater. That movie bombed, mostly because it was released on Easter weekend. You were expecting people who like horror movies to sit through three and a half hours and basically two movies in one. It was, it was a niche product. Grindhouse is really only going to appeal to certain moviegoers and probably um, on the budget that it was released at and with the advertising campaign it was released at, because they at least didn't scamp on the advertising, I'll, I'll say that about it. Uh, it was never going to be a mass blockbuster, even if Tarantino um, is a, a big draw on these things. It's recently come out with all the, the hubbub about Weinstein being, you know, a sexual harasser and rapist and predator, that Robert Rodriguez is claiming that he made the movie to sort of get back at Weinstein for um, what he did to Rose McGowan, who dated uh, Robert Rodriguez for a little while. So he made her the star, and they released it, and that Weinstein then buried it uh, to um, destroy it, and that's probably, I, I guess they're saying the Easter weekend release was for that reason. But they did advertise the hell out of the movie, so I don't really think it was buried in that regard. And also, if that is the case, that Robert Rodriguez made that movie, or at least the Planet Terror part of that movie, the Rose McGowan is also in Death Proof, the Tarantino half. But if he made that movie with Rose McGowan as the lead to get back at Weinstein, then why then did he put Rose McGowan in Machete, which is sort of a spin-off of Brian House, and then cut out every single one of her scenes so that they're only on they're only deleted scenes on the Blu-ray? Did he do that for um, Weinstein? Did he do it just because they broke up and he felt like cutting her out of his movie? I, I don't know. I digress. Also, doesn't have much to do with Mandy Lane, but. Because of Grindhouse bombing, the Weinstein Company got cold feet about releasing certain independent horror movies, and Mandy Lane became one of them. They did release it in England. It was released under the Dimension banner in England. Um, it still has Dimension films uh, all on the um, all on the credits, which you're not going to be able to read there, but trust me, they're on the case. Um, and they ended up selling it to this uh, upstart distributor called Senator Films. Uh, Senator Films also ended up releasing The Informers, a movie that's um, based on a Brett Easton Ellis uh, collection of short stories. I actually like that movie quite a bit, even though uh, Ellis himself does not, because uh, I, I guess I guess the, the finished film is very serious and dramatic, and the script in the original uh, intention of the movie was for it to be more comedic. There was also a subplot about vampires that was cut out of it. I don't know. <laughs> uh, there, was a, there was a lot of stuff behind the scenes with that movie as well that could make its whole other video, but it's not one of my favorites. It's just a movie I, I like and think is underrated. But Senator released The Informers because it had a, an all-star cast. You know, Billy Bob Thornton, Winona Ryder. It had, it had a lot of people in it. Uh, Mickey Rourke. But the movie bombed, and it pretty much caused Senator to go into bankruptcy. So they had the rights to Mandy Lane. The company goes into bankruptcy. They can't release it. So the movie ends up in distribution hell, uh, until finally, I think, um, the Weinstein Company ended up partnering with Radius uh, to release it, and they, they just dumped it direct to video and on demand. And this was, I think by the time they released it in the U.S., it was maybe 2013 or 2014, and the movie was made in 2006. And at that point, Amber Heard was a bigger star, um, but by that point, the movie had kind of lost any uh, chance it had ever of making money because everybody who wanted to see the movie at that point they either did what I did, which is buy the foreign Blu-ray, or they just fucking pirate baited. it. So it was sitting on the shelf too long and all of that helped. So yet another reason to fucking hate the Weinsteins because if it was sold because Grindhouse bombed and Grindhouse bombed because Weinstein purposely buried it to get back at Rose McGowan, who he apparently raped in a hotel room in Sundance in 1997, then the reason that this great movie got buried is because Weinstein's a fucking rapist piece of shit. So, whatever. But it's, it's available on American Blu-ray and American DVD now, so you don't have to shell out, you know, an extra couple bucks to import it from England. But it's a very good movie, and... If you've never seen it and I've just ruined the, the ending, you actually might be able to not have it ruined because you can appreciate now everything that's going on under the surface of the movie. And 
The twist is good if you're going to it fresh, but being able to, to look at it from that more like gender and cultural studies perspective of it, uh, which is really the reason I really like the movie, is, is probably, um, it's still not going to take away your enjoyment of it. So, all the boys love Mandy Lane. Uh, a couple housekeeping things. Um, I believe I'm uploading this video actually on Halloween. Um, if everything goes right, I'm uploading this video and another video for Dave's Haze on the same day, and that should cover the, the four horror movies in the month of October that I was trying to do but didn't have a lot of time. Um, and then I'm going to take a little bit of a break from Dave's Haze, maybe a week or two weeks. Um, I've got some other big stuff going on in my personal life, um, professional life. And, uh, and then I'll come back with some non-horror reviews for a little bit just to cleanse the palate. Um, but uh, thanks for sticking with me, all 30 to 40 of you who actually like these Dave Faze videos. And um, I guess I'll see you later today.